The First Step, an insightful essay on morality and compassion by Leo Tolstoy. Fasting is an indispensable condition of a good life. But in fasting, as in self-control in general, the question arises, with what shall we begin? How to fast? How often to eat? What to eat? What to avoid eating? And as we can do no work seriously without regarding the necessary order of sequence, so also we cannot fast without knowing where to begin, with what to commence self-control in food, fasting, and even an analysis of how to fast and where to begin. The notion seems ridiculous and wild to the majority of men. I remember how, with pride at his originality, an evangelical preacher who was attacking monastic asceticism once said to me, Ours is not a Christianity of fasting and privations, but of beefsteaks. Christianity, or virtue in general, and beefsteaks. During a long period of darkness and lack of all guidance, pagan or Christian, so many wild, immoral ideas have made their way into our life, especially into that lower region of the first steps toward a good life, our relation to food, to which no one paid any attention that it is difficult for us even to understand the audacity and senselessness of upholding, in our days, Christianity or virtue with beefsteaks. We are not horrified by this association, solely because a strange thing has befallen us. We look and see not, listen and hear not. There is no bad odour, no sound, no monstrosity, to which man cannot become so accustomed that he ceases to remark what would strike a man unaccustomed to it. Precisely so it is in the moral region, Christianity and morality with beefsteaks. A few days ago I visited the slaughterhouse in our town of Tula. It is built on the new and improved system practiced in large towns with a view to causing the animals as little suffering as possible. It was on a Friday, two days before Trinity Sunday. There were many cattle there, long before this, when reading that excellent book. The Ethics of Diet, I had wished to visit a slaughterhouse in order to see with my own eyes the reality of the question raised when vegetarianism is discussed, but at first I felt ashamed to do so, as one is always ashamed of going to look at suffering which one knows is about to take place, but which one cannot avert, and so I kept putting off my visit. But a little while ago I met on the road a butcher returning to Tula after a visit to his home. He is not yet an experienced butcher, and his duty is to stab with a knife. I asked him whether he did not feel sorry for the animals that he killed. He gave me the usual answer. Why should I feel sorry? It is necessary. But when I told him that eating flesh is not necessary, but is only a luxury, he agreed and then he admitted that he was sorry for the animals. But what can I do? I must earn my bread, he said. At first I was afraid to kill. My father, he never even killed a chicken in all his life. The majority of Russians cannot kill. They feel pity and express the feeling by the word fear. This man had also been afraid, but he was so no longer. He told me that most of the work was done on Fridays, when it continues until the evening. Not long ago, I also had a talk with a retired soldier, a butcher, and he too was surprised at my assertion that it was a pity to kill, and said the usual things about its being ordained. But afterwards, he agreed with me. Especially when they are quiet, tame cattle. They come, poor things, trusting you. It is very pitiful. This is dreadful. Not the suffering and death of the animals, but that man suppresses in himself unnecessarily the highest spiritual capacity, that of sympathy and pity toward living creatures like himself, and by violating his own feelings becomes cruel. And how deeply seated in the human heart is the injunction not to take life. Once, when walking from Moscow, I was offered a lift by some carters who were going from Serpuhov to a neighbouring forest to fetch wood. It was the Thursday before Easter. I was seated in the first cart with a strong, red, coarse carman, who evidently drank. On entering a village, we saw a well-fed, naked, pink pig being dragged out of the first yard to be slaughtered. It squealed in a dreadful voice, resembling the shriek of a man. 
Just as we were passing, they began to kill it. A man gashed its throat with a knife. The pig squealed still more loudly and piercingly, broke away from the men, and ran off covered with blood. Being nearsighted, I did not see all the details. I saw only the human-looking pink body of the pig and heard its desperate squeal, but the carter saw all the details and watched closely. They caught the pig, knocked it down, and finished cutting its throat. When its squeals ceased, the carter sighed heavily. Do men really not have to answer for such things, he said. So strong is man's aversion to all killing. But by example, by encouraging greediness, by the assertion that God has allowed it, and above all by habit, people entirely lose this natural feeling. On Friday, I decided to go to Tula, and meeting a meek, kind acquaintance of mine, I invited him to accompany me. Yes, I have heard that the arrangements are good, and have been wishing to go and see it, but if they are slaughtering, I will not go in. Why not? That's just what I want to see. If we eat flesh, it must be killed. No, no, I cannot. It is worth remarking that this man is a sportsman and himself kills animals and birds. So we went to the slaughterhouse. Even at the entrance one noticed the heavy, disgusting, fetid smell as of carpenter's glue or paint on glue. The nearer we approached, the stronger became the smell. The building is of red brick, very large, with vaults and high chimneys. We entered the gates. To the right was a spacious enclosed yard, three quarters of an acre in extent. Twice a week cattle are driven in here for sale, and adjoining this enclosure was the porter's lodge. To the left were the chambers, as they are called, i.e. rooms with arched entrances, sloping asphalt floors, and contrivances for moving and hanging up the carcasses. On a bench against the wall of the porter's lodge were seated half a dozen butchers, in aprons covered with blood, their tucked-up sleeves disclosing their muscular arms also besmeared with blood. They had finished their work half an hour before, so that day we could only see the empty chambers. Though these chambers were open on both sides, there was an oppressive smell of warm blood. The floor was brown and shining, with congealed black blood in the cavities. One of the butchers described the process of slaughtering and showed us the place where it was done. I did not quite understand him, and formed a wrong but very horrible idea of the way the animals are slaughtered, and I fancied that, as is often the case, the reality would very likely produce upon me a weaker impression than the imagination. But in this, I was mistaken. The next time I visited the slaughterhouse, I went in good time. It was the Friday before Trinity, a warm day in June. The smell of glue and blood was even stronger and more penetrating than on my first visit. The work was at its height. The duty yard was full of cattle, and animals had been driven into all the enclosures beside the chambers. In the street, before the entrance, stood carts to which oxen, calves and cows were tied, other carts drawn by good horses and filled with live calves whose heads hung down and swayed about, drew up, and were unloaded, and similar carts containing the carcasses of oxen with trembling legs sticking out with heads and bright red lungs and brown livers drove away from the slaughterhouse. The dealers themselves, in their long coats, with their whips and knouts in their hands, were walking about the yard, either marking with tar cattle belonging to the same owner, or bargaining or else guiding oxen and bulls from the great yard into the enclosures which lead into the chambers. These men were evidently all preoccupied with money matters and calculations, and any thought as to whether it was right or wrong to kill these animals was as far from their minds as were questions about the chemical composition of the blood that covered the floor of the chambers. No butchers were to be seen in the yard. They were all in the chambers at work. That day, about a hundred head of cattle were slaughtered. I was on the point of entering one of the chambers, but stopped short at the door. I stopped both because the chamber was crowded with carcasses which were being moved about, and also because blood was flowing on the floor and dripping from above. All the butchers present were besmeared with blood, and had I entered, I too should certainly have been covered with it. 
One suspended carcass was being taken down, another was being moved toward the door, a third, a slaughtered ox, was lying with its white legs raised, while a butcher with strong hand was ripping up its tight-stretched hide. Through the door opposite the one at which I was standing, a big, red, well-fed ox was led in. Two men were dragging it, and hardly had it entered when I saw a butcher raise a knife above its neck and stab it. The ox, as if all four legs had suddenly given way, fell heavily upon its belly, immediately turned over on one side, and began to work its legs in all its hind quarters. Another butcher at once threw himself upon the ox from the side opposite to the twitching legs, caught its horns and twisted its head down to the ground, while another butcher cut its throat with a knife. From beneath the head there flowed a stream of blackish-red blood, which a besmeared boy caught in a tin basin. All the time this was going on, the ox kept incessantly twitching its head as if trying to get up, and waved its four legs in the air. The basin was quickly filling, but the ox still lived, and its stomach heaving heavily, both hind and forelegs worked so violently that the butchers held aloof. When one basin was full, the boy carried it away on his head to the albumen factory, while another boy placed a fresh basin, which also soon began to fill up, but still the ox heaved its body and worked its hind legs. When the blood ceased to flow, the butcher raised the animal's head and began to skin it. The ox continued to writhe. The head, stripped of its skin, showed red with white veins, and kept the position given it by the butcher. On both sides hung the skin. Still the animal did not cease to writhe. Then another butcher caught hold of one of the legs, broke it, and cut it off. In the remaining legs and the stomach, the convulsion still continued. The other legs were cut off and thrown aside, together with those of other oxen belonging to the same owner. Then the carcass was dragged to the hoist and hung up, and the convulsions were over. Thus I looked on from the door at the second, third, fourth ox. It was the same with each, the same cutting off of the head with bitten tongue, and the same convulsed members. The only difference was that the butcher did not always strike at once so as to cause the animal's fall. Sometimes he missed his aim, whereupon the ox leaped up, bellowed, and covered with blood, tried to escape. But then his head was pulled under a bar, struck a second time, and he fell. I afterwards entered by the door at which the oxen were led in. Here I saw the same thing, only nearer, and therefore more plainly. But chiefly I saw here, what I had not seen before, how the oxen were forced to enter this door. Each time an ox was seized in the enclosure and pulled forward by a rope tied to its horns, the animal, smelling blood, refused to advance and sometimes bellowed and drew back. It would have been beyond the strength of, of two men to drag it in by force, so one of the butchers went round each time, grasped the animal's tail and twisted it so violently that the gristle crackled and the ox advanced. When they had finished with the cattle of one owner, they brought in those of another. The first animal of his next lot was not an ox, but a bull, a fine, well-bred creature, black, with white spots on its legs, young, muscular, full of energy. He was dragged forward, but he lowered his head and resisted sturdily. Then the butcher who followed behind seized the tail, like an engine driver grasping the handle of a whistle, twisted it, the gristle crackled, and the bull rushed forward, upsetting the men who held the rope. Then it stopped, looking sideways with its black eyes, the whites of which had filled with blood. But again the tail crackled, and the bull sprang forward and reached the required spot. The striker approached, took aim, and struck. But the blow missed the mark. The bull leaped up, shook his head, bellowed, and covered with blood, broke free and rushed back. The men at the doorway all sprang aside, but the experienced butchers, with the dash of men inured to danger, quickly caught the rope. Again, the tail operation was repeated, and again the bull was in the chamber, where he was dragged under the bar, from which he did not again escape. The striker quickly took aim at the spot where the hair divides like a star, and notwithstanding the blood, found it, struck, and the fine animal, full of life, collapsed.
its head and legs writhing while it was bled and the head skinned. There, the cursed devil hasn't even fallen the right way, grumbled the butcher as he cut the skin from the head. Five minutes later, the head was stuck up, red instead of black, without skin. The eyes that had shone with such splendid color five minutes before, fixed and glassy. Afterwards, I went into the compartment where small animals are slaughtered, a very large chamber with asphalt floor and tables with backs on which sheep and calves are killed. Here, the work was already finished. In the long room, impregnated with the smell of blood, were only two butchers. One was blowing into the leg of a dead lamb and patting the swollen stomach with his hand. The other, a young fellow in an apron besmeared with blood, was smoking a bent cigarette. There was no one else in the long, dark chamber, filled with a heavy smell. After me, there entered a man, apparently an ex-soldier, bringing in a young yearling ram, black with a white mark on its neck and its legs tied. This animal he placed upon one of the tables, as if upon a bed. The old soldier greeted the butchers, with whom he was evidently acquainted, and began to ask when their master allowed them leave. The fellow with the cigarette approached with a knife, sharpened it on the edge of the table, and answered that they were free on holidays. The live ram was lying as quietly as the dead inflated one, except that it was briskly wagging its short little tail, and its sides were heaving more quickly than usual. The soldier pressed down its uplifted head gently, without effort. The butcher, still continuing the conversation, grasped with his left hand the head of the ram and cut its throat. The ram quivered, and the little tail stiffened and ceased to wave. The fellow, while waiting for the blood to flow, began to relight his cigarette, which had gone out. The blood flowed and the ram began to writhe. The conversation continued without the slightest interruption. It was horribly revolting. And how about those hens and chickens which daily, in thousands of kitchens, with heads cut off and streaming with blood, comically, dreadfully flop about, jerking their wings? And see, a kind, refined lady will devour the carcasses of these animals with full assurance that she is doing right at the same time asserting two contradictory propositions. First, that she is, as her doctor assures her, so delicate that she cannot be sustained by vegetable food alone, and that for her feeble organism, flesh is indispensable. And secondly, that she is so sensitive that she is unable not only herself to inflict suffering on animals, but even to bear the sight of suffering whereas the poor lady is weak precisely because she has been taught to live upon food unnatural to man, and she cannot avoid causing suffering to animals, for she eats them. I only wish to say that for a good life, a certain order of good actions is indispensable, that if a man's aspirations toward right living be serious, they will inevitably follow one definite sequence, and in this sequence the first thing will be self-control in food, fasting. And in fasting, if he be really and seriously seeking to live a good life, the first thing from which he will abstain will always be the use of animal food, because to say nothing of the excitation of the passions caused by such food, its use is simply immoral, as it involves the performance of an act which is contrary to the moral feeling, killing. We cannot pretend that we do not know this. We are not ostriches and cannot believe that if we refuse to look at what we do not wish to see, it will not exist. This is especially the case when what we do not wish to see is what we wish to eat. If it were really indispensable, or if not indispensable, at least in some way useful, but it is quite unnecessary, and only serves to develop animal feelings, to excite desire, and to promote fornication and drunkenness. And this is continually being confirmed by the fact that young, kind, undepraved people, especially women and girls, without knowing how it logically follows, feel that virtue is incompatible with beefsteaks, and, as soon as they wish to be good, give up eating flesh. But why, if the wrongfulness of animal food was known to humanity so long ago, have people not yet come to acknowledge this law? will be asked by those who are accustomed to be led by public opinion rather by reason. 
The answer to this question is that the moral progress of humanity, which is the foundation of every other kind of progress, is always slow, but that the sign of true, not casual progress is its uninterruptedness and its continual acceleration. And the progress of vegetarianism is of this kind. That progress is expressed in the actual life of mankind, which from many causes is involuntarily passing more and more from carnivorous habits to vegetable food, and is also deliberately following the same path in a movement which shows evident strength and which is growing larger and larger, namely vegetarianism. That movement has during the last ten years advanced more and more rapidly. More and more books and periodicals on this subject appear every year. One meets more and more people who have given up meat. And abroad, especially Germany, England and America, the number of vegetarian hotels and restaurants increases year by year. This movement should cause special joy to those whose life lies in the effort to bring about the kingdom of God on earth, not because vegetarianism is in itself an important step towards that kingdom. All true steps are both important and unimportant. But because it is a sign that the aspiration of mankind towards moral perfection is serious and sincere, for it has taken the one unalterable order of succession natural to it, beginning with the first step. One cannot fail to rejoice at this, as people could not fail to rejoice who, after striving to reach the upper story of a house by trying vainly and at random to climb the walls from different points, should at last assemble at the first step of the staircase and crowd towards it, convinced that there can be no way up except by mounting this first step of stairs. <laughs>